This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Mile High Ambulance. I want to talk about Narcan, as this is something that we see quite frequently. So we all know about the opiate epidemic, but just to put some numbers to it, for Americans that are age 18 to 45, opiates are the leading cause of death. And roughly that comes out to about 71,000 people in the year of 2022 that died of opiate overdoses. So let's talk about Narcan specifically. So what is Narcan? Narcan is a opioid competitive antagonist, meaning that it binds the same site as the agonist, but it does not activate the receptor, thus blocks the agonist action. So when do we actually give Narcan or what are the indications for it? Really, it's predipnea. So respiratory rate less than around the 8 to 10 range is when I give it. So a normal respiratory rate is highly suggestive of an alternative diagnosis, and you probably don't need Narcan. So what about pupil size? Classically, we're always taught that opioid intoxication causes a small pinpoint pupil, which is true. However, there are some caveats to this. So in severe opioid intoxication, you actually get a hypercapnia as you're not breathing, which then can trigger a sympathetic response, which could actually normalize or even dilate the pupil size briefly. And a lot of these patients also, as we know, have co-ingestions with other forms of sympathomimetics like cocaine or meth, which may block pupil constriction or even dilate pupils. And then additionally, there's other conditions such as a basilar stroke, which can also have small pupils and could lead you down a really entirely wrong path. So yes, it is true that small pupils do suggest opioid intoxication, but should not be taken in isolation as a sign of opioid intoxication. And really normal pupil size does not exclude opiate intoxication either. So how does Narcan affect the body? Let's look at three different scenarios here. So one will be if you give someone Narcan who's not on opioids, as you thought maybe they were, really doesn't have any adverse effects and is pretty relatively safe in, in these patients. Two, so this is the opiate naive patient who took kind of more of their prescribed med or something for the first time. So here, a large dose of Narcan is safe and actually encouraged. So somewhere in the 0.4 to 2 milligrams with repeating every three to five minutes as needed. And then three is the chronic opioid user. So the goal here is to give just enough to avoid apnea, but not one to send into uh, withdrawal. So talking about 0.04 to 0.4. And I I realize for our paramedic folks out there, um, it's obviously tough to tell the difference between the above three when you're out on scene and nobody's ever fault you for giving the full dose of Narcan. Just be aware that a precipitated withdrawal can be a tough patient to deal with, but we'll take that over a corpse any day. So let's talk about time to Narcan onset. So if it's IV, this comes on about one to two minutes. Intranasally, it's about three to four minutes. And then intramuscularly around six minutes with a duration of on average 60 minutes with a range of somewhere in the 20 to 90 minutes. So let's contrast that with the actual duration of the opiates that are out there. So heroin lasts about 60 minutes, fentanyl somewhere in the 30 to 60 minute range, depending on the route, car fentanyl somewhere up to five hours, and then methadone somewhere in the 12 to 24 hour range. So with this in mind, we we really need to be cognizant of, of redosing our Narcan and not just giving our one-time dose, high-fiving each other for saving someone's life and forgetting to check on that patient again. So how do we monitor these patients in the ER? End title CO2 is is really the, the money here. I'm always super careful with placing these patients on oxygen because what we really care about is their ventilation. So if you give oxygen to this patient, you decrease their respiratory drive further and you mask the hypoventilation. So we see an artificial prop up of their oxygen and then a precipitous drop in the O2 later on. So we can avoid this by watching our respiratory rate and our and our CO2 and then give give Narcan as needed. So there's no real like hard rule on how long to observe these patients in the ER. General rule of thumb that I was always taught by our toxicologists was around two to four hours after the last Narcan dose, depending on you know how many doses they got and how large the doses were. So the larger the dose, the longer the obs time. So who gets a Narcan drip? For me, if someone, if EMS gave a dose and then they required two doses in the ER over several hours, you're going to put them on a drip. So basically you start at two thirds, your last effective wake up dose, and that's your drip. 
So let's talk about the complications of Narcan. The non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or flash pulmonary edema is this kind of feared, feared complication. It happens somewhere in the 0.2 to 3.6% of Narcan patients. Usually it's associated with large doses of Narcan. There's a couple different theories. One is that you're getting a large adrenergic response with a, a big surge of catecholamines from the abrupt wake up. And the other theory is that following a prolonged period of, of near or complete apnea, you get this reversal that results in an inspiratory effort prior to a complete opening of the glottis that results in excess negative pressure within the lung that can draw fluid in from the pulmonary vasculature. So if this happens, positive pressure ventilation like BiPAP, if awake, is a great treatment. And if they're not really awake or not protecting their airway, obviously intubation. Something that gets asked a lot is, should we give Narcan in cardiac arrest? The short answer is no. It's not going to fix the problem or reverse the arrest. We're already breathing for the patient, and that's the one thing that really Narcan affects. So what they really need is, is high-quality CPR, ventilations, defibrillation, and ACLS meds. So that's all on Narcan, guys. Let's have a great day. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Health One Continental Division and Swedish Medical Center for their financial contributions to the EMM. Donations from them and listeners like you make it possible for us to fulfill our mission of producing and spreading free medical education to the masses. If you enjoy our show, please consider making a one-time or reoccurring donation to help cover our operational costs and keep the EMM awesome. Click on the link in our show notes to make a donation. Thank you for listening.